And real quick question for people. So, you know, the more interactive you can and want to be in the chat, go, go ahead and do that. Um, anybody brand new to the group here? And what I really mean is, um, you know, how well do you understand uh, the strategy I bring to FX Street here? Supply and demand, okay. All right. New or struggling is okay too. We'll get there, second live session, all right. All right, so let's just, let's dive in. We'll do a combination of looking at the live markets and, um, and you know, explaining strategy. Sometimes we just fly through markets. Here's, a, here's an area where you might want to consider buying. Here's an area you want to, might want to consider selling. But, uh, but yeah, so, okay. And before I even, well, we'll do that. Here, let me give you this. Um, I didn't realize there was many new people in here. It's not a problem. Okay, so before I forget, because I always forget, there's my email address. If you have any questions, you can always send me an email there, and I'll do my best to get back to, to those. Um, all right. So one of the things that's important, because I see some, I get, to, I get emails and I see some people are struggling in that, and then when I dive into what those struggles are, I see not always, but typically what the challenge is. And often it has to do with this. Yeah, we can certainly do that, Michael. And if I forget, just remind me, but we'll do that when we identify some trading opportunities in a few minutes. Um, so one of the things I see that keeps happening is, so, you know, I developed a strategy uh, many years ago on the trading floor at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And, um, and, and really, you know, the original version of the strategy, which is what I give you here, and again here, we'd over, we never have like big lessons, we just kind of go over it, right, and apply it. But where, where I, what I see is there's a lot of people uh, since, since then that have come along and, um, Many have been students from time to time, but, but did, now there's different versions of supply and demand. You have different people teaching supply and demand and building supply and demand things. Um, the challenge is most of those people did not actually, and I'm not beating anybody up here, but the challenge is most of those people didn't actually do the work to understand how it really works. Um, and uh, so now what happens is you get so many copycats out there, you get lots of different versions, right? And so what I want to do is try to help you keep it, you know, really simple, back to basics, focus on the very, very few things that you need to focus on, right? Um, okay. So, again, yeah, and, and I, see, I see a couple comments in the chat. For example, Mark, uh, welcome, by the way. I see you only personally use trend lines and horizontal support resistance. Okay. So supply and demand is very different from support and resistance, and um, and we don't use trend lines, and that's okay. It's uh it's okay that you do. Um, so, but I want to when I, my comment is I want to explain why and what the difference is. Okay, and as and as soon as we get through some of this, we'll we'll dive right into the markets, and we'll we'll keep going and going and just looking at markets and supply and demand and all that. I'll never forget the first time I, someone introduced conventional technical analysis to me with trends and trend lines and, and uh, support resistance and all the chart patterns and indicators and oscillators and all that stuff. So when I first saw that stuff, it, it didn't make any sense to me because the entries and exits into the markets were almost opposite of what I was doing and what people like me were doing. Okay? So... Um, let me give an example, right? Let's just talk about the basic definitions of support and resistance, right? That most people use in their trading um, trends and support and resistance. The, 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 the major flaw, I mean, there's a number of major flaws with just conventional support and resistance, even though it's like in the trading basically Bibles out there, right? Um, think about it. To draw a support line, to have a support line, how many points do you need on a chart? How many times, how many pivot lows do you need on a chart to draw a support line? All right, Alfredo's saying two minimum. Nolte's saying two. Yeah, so two or three, right? Okay, so at least two, we could probably all agree with that. Now, 
if you think about it, every time price comes down and you have that pivot, those pivot lows, so now you have two or three, now you can draw that line. What are you supposed to do the next time price comes back to the line you just drew, which is called support? What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to buy. Exactly. Right? It's in every trading book and course ever written. Um, exactly. There you go, Alfredo. Be nice. I'm just kidding. So, but think about it. Now let's folk, now let's have the conversation through the eyes of how the markets really work. Okay? Meaning those pivot lows are there because there's some demand there. Right? I think we can all agree with that. There's demand there and demand exceeds supply. That's the only reason you can have those pivot lows. So now you have two or three of those into that area of demand. What's happening to the amount of demand as that picture that represents support is being created? What's happening to the amount of demand? Is it increasing or decreasing? It's decreasing. Those buy orders are getting filled. So the next time price comes down, you're supposed to buy, we're supposed to buy. That, that, that setup literally forces you to wait and then take the high risk, low probability trading opportunity or investing opportunity. Does that make sense? What that's saying is don't buy when the probability is stacked in your favor. Wait until the buy orders are gone or reduced and then buy. Does that make sense? And listen, I, I wouldn't, am never going to claim to be smarter than anybody else. The only reason why I think this way is because, and I figured this stuff out, is because I started my career on a trading floor with real buy and sell orders from some of the biggest banks and financial institutions in the world. So you, you see how it really works. And anyone around me would be telling you the exact same thing I do, right? I didn't create or in any of this as supply and demand. It's been around forever. This is just happens to be how the markets work. Had I not learned that way and had that experience, I'd be reading books and thinking like everybody else. Remember, there's a reason why most traders lose money and most long-term investors never come close to achieving their financial goals. There's also a reason why banks and financial institutions are right in their decision-making process most of the time and as a whole tend to make a lot of money. Remember, there's two groups at play here, one that does very well and one that doesn't, and they're both buying and selling in the same market. So. You need to figure out what is one group doing that the other group isn't. Does that make sense? Okay. So, and that's that's the focus here. That is the focus. Now, why why do you know the, the supply and demand levels that we focus on here aren't just any old supply and demand levels? We want to focus on the significant levels where there's a huge imbalance. And for that, and and those are the footprints of big banks and financial institutions where they're buying and selling. Does that make sense? Why, why do they live, leave the biggest footprints? Because they have the biggest orders. They create the biggest imbalances. And, and that's okay. People say, oh, you'll never know what Goldman Sachs is doing. You'll never know what this group is doing. And this group is so secretive, or, or there you have dark pools and stuff. No, all that stuff is reflected on the chart, all of it, okay? Um, all right, let me just catch up in the chat here. Ah, so Max, I'm glad I, glad I read back because I, uh, uh, I, I, I see your, uh, that, yeah, so, um, yeah, I, I would have missed that. Um, yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't suggest at all that that there's main there's you know that there's it's market orders uh, moving the market. Um, from my experience, it's it's mainly limit or limit type orders, if that makes sense. In other words, what I'm getting at specifically is the smart money. And think of a smart buyer and seller of anything. And I'm sure most of you are, the, are fall into this category. If you have something you want to buy, and you're someone who does your research, and you look up on the internet you know, what the best price is for whatever you're looking to buy. Maybe it's some electronic, maybe it's a computer, television, car, home, you name it. If you're someone who really does your research, okay, um, 
and you know, so you so you know what a good price is for the for the product that you want to buy. Um, what most what most people like that will do is they'll say, okay, that's what I'm paying for that product, and I'm not going to pay a, a penny more for it, right? I mean, do we have people in our group that that focus like that? Does anybody have use coupons to buy things or wait for things to go on sale? If you do that, okay. So most people that do that don't tend not to have big money problems, right? I'm not saying everyone that does that is is super wealthy, but people that do that tend not tend, tend to be smart buyers and sellers of anything. People that have money and and attain that wealth, you know, uh, the right way, like legally and 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 all that, um, and follow the rules. They tend to make those types of decisions. Look, there, there's only w one way that all these companies make money, whether it's the big retail stores around the world like um, Walmart, Costco, uh, Amazon. Uh, what's the big one in India? Big Bazaar. Uh, forgot the big one in Asia. Just all those companies. And you can also include Gold Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Barclays. Uh, all of them, all the big banks around the world, they all make money the same way. They buy it wholesale and sell it retail, right? That's what they do. And if they don't do that and aren't good at that, they're not going to be in business. Does that make sense? That's all we're doing here. Okay. So let's move on and let's start looking at some charts here before we run out of time. But it's so important that you have the right mindset. I guess that's that's why I kind of, talk about that stuff so much because if you don't have the the right market or money mindset you know trying to trying to follow a, a picture on a chart that I'm going to show you is not going to work okay okay um I don't care what markets we look at what we talk about here the strategy uh, the supply demand strategy I developed uh is equally applicable to any market any time frame any financial purpose so you tell me what markets you want to look at and we will go there um all right we can look at uh it has been a while since i looked at the canadian swiss against each other but why don't we go there um yeah i have not uh i have not looked at this market in a long time but let's do it okay now why is that not sorry about that it's... okay so let's uh hang on all right i'll try to get to as many of those as possible so the first chart or, or that we want to, no matter what our, we're doing, we want to start with the larger time frame. We want to know in the big picture supply-demand uh, relationship, where are prices at? So if we just quickly pull up the larger time frame chart, we get a little information there, uh, not much. Um, now I'm going to go to a daily chart, okay? So is this chart giving us any information? Well, you know, we don't have any big time frame demand below. Uh, maybe some evidence of some supply above, and we see where prices are at. So I'm going to quickly go to a different time frame, but at least, at least I'm getting a good general idea here, right? So now I go to uh, the four-hour chart, and now we we can we can identify some action actionable levels. So how we do this is, you want to start with uh, current price, right here. Go. For demand, go down and left until we find our fresh quality demand zone that meets the criteria we're looking for. Okay, um, and then for the supply side, the same thing. So if we do that, um, neither of these two areas represent demand, um, but this one can. Right, this one would meet uh, probably meet the criteria. Let's let's deal with it uh, for a minute here very uh, mechanical way that we uh, place our proximal and distal lines here in uh, in the demand zone okay and there's that now for people that are new to the program or new to the sessions um, let me let me make it really really simple here for you Let's blow the chart up a little bit more Price is trading sideways. Think about it. Um, and all of a sudden, 
Well, supply and demand appears to be in balance here, right? Right, because price really isn't moving up or down. It's just trading sideways. It appears to be in balance. And all of a sudden, there's a strong rally in price. The reason why this rally happens is because demand actually exceeded supply in the level at the origin of the area, correct? Okay. Now, how can we speak so strong to that, like with, with so much certainty for it? Not certainty, but you understand what I'm saying. The reason is because if supply and demand were equal here, wouldn't price just keep trading sideways? If supply and demand were in balance or equal, price wouldn't move, correct? It would just stay here. It couldn't. And it had to rally higher. Why? Because ultimately demand exceeded supply here or exceeds supply. Now price uh, moves higher until it uh, you know, reaches some supply. Obviously it's hitting a little area here, but this is not, we would not call this a fresh supply zone. Okay, the area we would be looking at above this is up here, but we'll get to that in a minute. Now, remember the two groups I talked about earlier? And I think you want to really keep it that simple. What is the group that, you know, what is, what, how does the group that makes money, how do they think and how do they act? And the group that doesn't, how do they think and how do they act? That's what I focused on. Now, if and when price comes back to the demand zone, well, first of all, who has an account size to cause a rally like this in a, in a big Forex market uh, like we're looking at here? Anybody in our group have an account size to cause that kind of a rally in this, in this big FX market? No? You raise your hand, you're going to be the most popular person in our session today. I'm just kidding. All right. So, <clears throat> exactly. Okay? So there is, it's a significant, maybe, maybe it's, and it's not just one person or one group, right? But collectively, banks, financial institutions had way too much to buy here, and there wasn't enough uh, supply to get all those orders filled at that level. That's why price goes higher. Okay? Next, if and when price comes down to the level, okay, so, so we have an idea of who's on the buy side down here at this price. Now let's talk about the sell side. Who would the seller be down here? More importantly, to keep it simple, let's look at the actions of who would be selling down here if and when price comes back. Well, the actions are this. First, price would uh, be falling, so that seller would be selling after a drop in price. Not a smart thing to do. And number two, they'd be selling at a price level where the chart already told us demand exceeds supply. Right? Okay? If you sell after a drop in price, if your strategy is to consistently sell after declines in price and sell at price levels where banks and financial institutions are buying, what do you think your winning percentage is going to be? Is it going to be high or is it going to be low? Uh, or maybe the better question is what's your losing percentage going to be, right? Can you think of a worse time to sell in this market? Is there a worse place to sell? And if the answer is no or something close to no, maybe you just found the best place to buy, right? So, and, and again, I don't want to over explain. We got to keep it simple, but so think about what happens when price comes back here. That's where you at that moment have the two groups matched up against each other. The group that consistently makes money and the group that consistently doesn't. Does that make sense? The goal of these sessions is to help you stop thinking and acting like a retail trader and investor or a novice trader and investor and start thinking and acting like a bank or financial institution. Does that make sense? The vast majority of people on the world, around the world are on the wrong side of that equation when it comes to the right money mindset or market mindset. Um, yo, Pip, it, yeah, Pip, I, I, hear, I see your question there. Um, it, it, I guess it depends if you're, if you're, it depends if you're focused on fresh supply and demand levels. Look, a lot of people are focused on pivot lows as demand and pivot highs as supply. I would expect many losses with, you know, if someone is focused on that because prices should go through those levels. Okay, if you're focused on fresh supply and demand low zones, right, fresh meaning prices haven't come back, you should have a much higher winning percentage. Okay, it also depends on 
your profit zone. Okay, the bit. So let let's get some some supply in here, and then we can focus on profit zone. Hopefully, this is helpful. I know we're going kind of slow. I know we have some new people to the group. So here is a supply zone without looking at, at, at uh, too much information here. Right, I want to look at look, another couple time frames. I don't want to explain all this to you. Okay, so the distance between supply and demand is our profit zone. Okay, and the and and Pip R more to your to to your question there. The the distance, the greater the distance between your supply and demand zone, right? The greater the profit zone, the higher the probability your trade is is likely to be. Okay, does everybody understand why? The further out you go on the supply demand curve. The, the more demand and supply is out there, if that makes sense. Um, I have a lot of screenshots that and, and kind of lesson-based stuff I can share with you, but it, I don't have it. Uh, I didn't bring it for this session, but we can do that in another session. Actually, I believe we have another session coming up um, in a week or two, but I'm not sure. Our, our friends at FX Street can help us with that information. Um, Navjet is asking a good question. Should we worry about supply that's being created on the way down to a demand zone? Um, typically, typically the answer is no because there would have, if that is, let's say a new supply zone, let's say, um, let's say price comes back down, or let's say price goes up to the supply zone and right now we're thinking we're good. We want to sell short here. But I think I think a, one of the questions in the chat is, well, what happens if a new demand zone develops um, on the way up? The answer is that's not likely. A, a new demand zone developing that we should worry about is not likely. Why? Because if that was going to happen, we would see a supply zone like this lower. Now we have a gap here. Let's see if this gap is. I'm not too worried about this gap because we've been here two times. So, in other words. Let me say it this way. Typically, the way that a new demand zone would develop on the way up, that should scare you, that may scare you out of a, a, a shorting opportunity, okay, is when um, what's going to cause that type of demand zone to develop is this type of supply zone. If you don't have this down here, well, you're not likely to develop a, a, a new demand zone, okay? And if, and if for someone that has that question, okay, um, for someone that has that question, that suggests to me that you're not you're you're not thinking this through the right way yet. Remember, every key supply zone is there because of of a prior you know a, a every zone is there because of another zone's existence. Okay, to be very real. Every, all, all the any any new de, any demand that you see is is new demand is there because of, of of supply that was there prior to that. Yes. So 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 uh, and some people are asking questions publicly, privately. I guess it doesn't matter. So uh, um, let's see. Yeah, so Blender, I put my email above. Uh, do you see it up there? I know you're asking for the email. So that, that's, my, that's my email address up there. Um, yeah, so a level that, yeah, a, a level that, here, let me put it this way. Uh, you see the supply zone up here that we put in the chart, that I put in the chart? Eventually, there's likely to be a really good demand zone somewhere in that area. Does that make sense? Why? Because the chart is suggesting there's quite a bit of supply right here. Therefore, it's going to take quite a bit of demand to get through that. Now, are we likely to get it? What's likely to happen right now? Is there likely to be a some new demand forming right now to get through these pivot highs? Yeah, there's like that's likely to develop. One of two things is going to happen here. Price is either going to fall because there's still some supply at the gap, or price is going to base a little bit and go up and create what's going to appear to be a new demand zone. But here's the catch. Because price has been up to this gap supply once, you know, twice, maybe even almost close to three times this area, 
there's probably there's not likely to be that much supply left so it's not going to take a lot of demand to get to cause that to happen therefore I wouldn't be too worried about this demand if, if a demand zone develops here. Does that make sense? All right. And let me do this. Let me see. Hang on a second. I'm just going to put a horizontal line on the chart here. And uh, again, I have not looked at this market in a long time. So let's see. I don't even know what we're going to. Oh, we're not going to hit price for a while, I believe, right? Ah, see how we hit this right here? Does everybody see that? This is the first time we see that line again. Okay, so obviously there was a ton of demand there. Did you see what happened there the first time we hit that? Everybody see that on the bottom of the chart? Therefore, how much supply here, and notice we found the supply zone first. So the logic is, we probably need it. We probably need a lot of supply to get through that after the react that reaction just back there. Okay, these are these are just some little little things, little nuances we look for. You know, very uh, very simple routine to do this. You just have to have the right rules and, and obviously the right right uh, mindset for it. Okay, we're spending a lot of time on one chart. Um, let me scroll back. Let's find the next one. Now, one last thing, knowing where these levels are likely to be on the larger time frame, which we have here, we can then, because price is somewhat in the middle, we can then go down to, if let's say you wanted to day trade this market. Well, now we know that we're not near larger time frame demand or supply, so small time frame supply or demand zones that come up on a, you know, on a, on a obviously a little time frame um, should be okay as long as they meet our criteria. But the closer we get to one of these bigger picture levels, that scenario changes. All right, let's look at, let's see what the next one on the list here was. You know, we've got the euro, oil. Oil's bouncing off one of our, uh, one of our zones here this morning. Um, let's keep going here. So, yeah, let's get to the euro. And I believe we'll focus probably on the four-hour chart there. Little side note on the euro, it's just nearing uh, what it did. It kind of came into our uh, a supply zone we had on the daily, and it's sort of backing off that. You can see that down there. Um, but having said that, uh, let me take you to, let's see, what, there was a time frame. Oh, this one. Couple levels to focus on here. Uh, let me go to this spot. I believe I have all these levels for you in the spot. Yeah, so this area we got close to this morning. Now, before I show you this, though, let me give you some bigger picture context. All right, so bigger picture context, we're down into a big, ugly area of demand that we've been focused on. So you gotta be a little careful with shorts, you know, near here. However, however, there is a supply zone uh, that we've been focused on here at the 109, basically it's 109.02 ish right there, 109 to 10940. This is a larger time frame. We'll go down to smaller time frames in a minute. Um and yeah, there you go. So you see how price barely touched that level a couple times here? And had trouble getting back there, you know that 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 also leads to the assumption that there's a, a decent amount of supply up there, okay? And that supply zone, you know, all of this has happened after rallying off of uh, that. There's that demand zone right there. See that same picture we just looked at in the other market, but that's the demand zone, and, and we had that. Uh, we went over some of these in the sessions here at FX Street. So if anybody took that one, well done. Um, and now on the way down, we have two supply zones sitting here on top of each other. Okay. All right. Um, so there's that. And then let's see, take you to the 60-minute chart. Um, no, we didn't have that there. Okay. Um, let me see this. 
Okay. So I also have a screener that um, sometimes I'll, you know, I'll use it to uh, identify opportunities. Let me see if I can uh, have any here. Hold on. Ah, so here's a little tiny, this is a day trading opportunity, but so the screener did find a couple nice areas in the euro. So let's go back to our charts here. That's, a, that's an automated tool um, I built a while back. And again, I, I know there's probably, I know there's some other automated tools that people have built around supply and demand. The problem is they're built off of um, not the right rules. Um, so anyway, I wanted to just check with that, but I, I did see that little demand zone down there. So let's go, let's go find that here. All right, go back to the screener for a minute. So that's the 108.30. Ah, okay, that's this level right here. So let me just get this in here for you. All right, so this level is sitting just below current price. Oops. Uh, Des Jackson, yes. Yeah. So um, I put my email address in there above. You can always uh, email me if you want. Um, yeah, there is. You know, we try to get, try to get as much of that out here in the FX Street sessions uh, as we can. And there's lots of videos, but um, yeah, let's keep going over this, and then hopefully you can get a, a more better better understanding. And again, for those who came late to the group, again, all we're doing here um, is applying a strategy that. Uh, it's just based on how the markets really work. I developed it many years ago. And, and if you think about it, you know, if you really understand it, it's you know, the movement of price in any and all markets is a function right, of a simple supply and demand relationship. Low risk, high reward, and high probability opportunity is present when this simple and straightforward equation is out of balance. Does everybody understand that? That's what it is. Okay. Uh, Max, which which one are you? Uh, which one are you referring to? So notice I didn't take this one. See this one right here. I didn't choose this one because it's not fresh anymore. That, right? Not fresh. Let's go right here. Okay. Great level worked out. Was working out. You know, fine but it's not fresh anymore. So I want to go where the fresh stack of buy orders is, the fresh demand is. Okay. All right, let me go to another chart here real quick. Yeah, so if you look at the 30-minute chart, so yeah, you have this area right here. That We would never call that a demand zone. Remember, a demand zone is never just one candle. Um, we would never use one candle as a uh, demand zone. If we did, you know, everything would look uh, look like a demand zone. I, I mean, we'd have supply and demand zones everywhere. And if we go down to smaller time frames, what you're going to see is this wasn't a demand zone at all. Price just went up, down, and then went up. Does that make sense? So yeah, that something like that would never qualify as uh, as demand. Uh, all right, all right, okay. Um, so we found um, another, a couple areas of demand. We found an area of supply in the euro. Uh, where do we want to go next? Again, any market, any time frame, and then uh, you know, if you're a day trader to your longer term investor, let me scroll back here. I know. Oh, people want to look at oil, gold, the S and P. Yeah, so we can look at the S and P. Sure. I mean, we can look at any of these, not a problem. Um, well, it looks like the S&P is coming into a little area here. All right. Um, uh, 
There's the little SP. What I wanted to show you though was so there are buying opportunities. Um, for those that are in the morning sessions I, I deliver every day, um, we had uh, we actually had this. We focus a lot on uh, buying into the equity index markets. You know, we had the uh, the March lows. We we had that in most of the major markets, and and also a number of stocks associated with that. But with this big run up, what's happening now is take a look. It's important that you know this. We're getting very close to, well, not, not that close, but uh, we were close much earlier this morning to this supply in the NASDAQ around 90.91, 90.92-ish. Okay, it's a big area, so, but remember, we've had this big run-up. Um, we've gone over this area and others in these sessions, and but now this big run-up has gone through the big profit zone that we had, and now we're getting close to this. So in the equity index markets, you have to be careful, in other words, as far as buying, right? Buying at current prices, probably not ideal, right? And we were kind of talking about that yesterday and, and today, um, not, not, uh, not ideal. We want to be buyers in the equity index markets, but not, not, uh, not from those levels, okay? Does that make sense? And now why am I showing you that level in the NASDAQ? When, when someone asked for the S&P, right? Because that level does not show up as clear in the S&P, but we can, here you go, right? If I go to a four hour chart of the S&P, right? That, that level doesn't just show up as clear. So we can take that NASDAQ level. Now the NASDAQ is a stronger one out of the bunch. Um, but you know, here's our bigger time frame demand in the S and P. Significant supply is higher, but again, the the closer we get to this Nasdaq supply, the more we kind of want to, you know, you no know, buying is not ideal. Okay. All right. Um, let's keep going here. Let's take a look at. Here's the dollar. I see a bunch of people having questions. So there's my email address again, samsiden at gmail.com. I'm sorry, that's incorrect. Never know what it is. Uh, when I looked at it, I realized it was wrong. Here it is. Trader at gmail. That's the correct email address. All right, when we look at the dollar, there's a, a couple charts we're going to need to look at. The 60 minute is important because, and these are uh, these are areas that we go over in these sessions. Okay, so price hit our supply zone, then fell to our demand zone, hit our supply zone again, and now we're back in the middle. So you have to be very careful entering positions in the FX markets now because price is in the middle of, of supply and demand. That's not where we want to be entering positions. That's where people typically lose money. Uh, people that buy and sell in the middle, in the in the white space. If you're you're in uh, in those morning sessions, right? You got to be careful with that. Don't want to, you know, you probably don't want to be entering positions here. And because we're looking at the dollar, other big markets against the dollar are going to be in a similar position. And when I go to the four-hour chart, which is a little bit bigger time frame we can see significant demand for the dollar is still lower, right? We've already had one pullback to our 98.25. You kind of have a couple levels sitting there on top of each other. All right, let's move on to oil and let's see. 30 minute chart, is this where we have our levels? Um, oh, we have some supply zones there. Let me find the demand zones. Ah. So let me get this down to a, let's see here. Not that one, I thought there's a, here. Uh, we came down into our, our, okay. So we came down our demands, we're well off that now. So. 
Um, yeah, probably not much to look at in oil at the moment. Only because it just, again, it just kind of came off our, uh, it did come off our demand zones. So is anybody here in the morning sessions with us? So we have this area down here just below all that. Is anybody here in my morning sessions? Probably not. Okay. All right. So that was, that was this level. There we go. So these are the levels we've been going over for days. Um, a bunch of days and this first demand zone we got a little pull back to that and a nice maybe three four to one rally uh, but since then we've come down to the ten ten dollar to eight sixty level obviously now we're rallying off that significant supply is still higher so there's a nice big profit zone to the upside but at this point there's not much to do right this first level worked out fine so we could probably just get rid of that um, that one's done and now we're just moving higher off of the, uh, the demand down here. Now, uh, and again, if you've been in the sessions, we've been, you know, we've, we've been going over this for days, but take a look. So why is that demand? Well, let me blow up the chart and show you, right? Big part of why we're here today is to, so you can help understand this. Okay, you start to see what's in there. Take a look at that. Right, here's the low in oil from the other day. Price comes up. Base is sideways for a very short period of time and then shoots out of here like a rocket. That suggests that there's a big supply demand imbalance here on the demand side. Okay. Price then, take a look. Oops. Price then attempts to come back to that level but can't even do it. Why? Because demand exceeds supply so much down here. Then it looks like um, price comes back and well, it didn't even barely touch it this morning and shoots up like a rocket. Okay, so there's some demand down here. The other thing we've been really focused on is um, in the sessions are oil stocks like ExxonMobil. So here's the buy we had um, for the uh, you know for the morning session group. But you know you can also play oil that way all you know too. Okay. Through, through the stock. So even though oil's been falling, the, the key stocks in that sector have been holding up really, really strong. Okay. Yeah, no, I know we're out of time. Uh, these sessions usually go about 45 minutes. So yeah, it was great to be with you. And again, I, uh, for those that, uh, you know, understand and have been in the sessions, you know, my apologies for going so slow, but we had a bunch of new people in the session. So I want to make sure they had a general understanding of what we're talking about. And, um, and we get some good levels out there. And uh, there you go. All right, have a great day, everyone. Again, if you have any questions, comments, anything like that, you have my email address. And, um, and there are more videos and stuff like that uh, on FX Street's website. So we'll see you next time. All right, have a great day, everyone.